again and I thank you for joining us again for this week's lesson on our Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis YouTube page. We are so happy that you chose to join us. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for once again bringing us together as we study your word. And as always, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we are on article number 13. And, or rather, we continue to be on article number 13, a gospel church. And our author writes, We believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by the covenant in the faith and the fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ governed by his laws and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that it is that its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualification, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. And our scripture uh, continues to come from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. And today we will read verses 7 through 9 of those verses. And it's from the NIV version. Again, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, <clears throat> verses 7 through 9, the NIV. It reads, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. And so in verses uh, 7, Paul lets the church at Corinth know that they had everything they needed to live out the Christian life. And he lets us know that we have everything we need to live out the Christian life. They were blessed in all spiritual gifts and they lacked nothing. And he let them know that these spiritual gifts were not a temporary thing. He, he gives the church the assurance that they would have everything they needed while they eagerly waited for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 8, he gives them a promise. He says, he, meaning Christ, will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you recall last time, we decided to break up that verse into a part A and a part B. And if you missed part A, go back on our YouTube page and watch last week's lesson. So verse 8, he says, he will keep you strong to the end. That's part A. So that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's part B. So Paul, in verses 4 through 6, uh, it, it's like he gives the prerequisite for verses 7 and 8. He, he says, God has given them and us his grace. And because of his grace, he has enriched us in everything. I think most of us fail to realize the importance of his grace. We cannot have grace, the grace of Christ, and not be rich. We are rich just because we have the grace of Christ. In this present life, we do not lack anything. His grace provides us with all that we need. We do not lack anything because we have a living hope in Christ coming back personally to take us to himself. Even though we are guilty of thinking that physical riches are the most important for this current life, the reality is that the riches of this world can be gone in a flash. It's not a firm foundation. Hoping in riches is not a firm foundation. I, I, I think about the people of Ukraine, how 
they had to leave their whole country, not just their homes, but their whole country, a lot of them, millions left, with only what they could carry. I, I would imagine that some of them had some great possessions, but because of a tyrant, it literally all went up in smoke. I think about the idea behind buying a warranty for a large purchase. You know, you go to the store and buy uh, a large purchase, a, a washing machine, a refrigerator, a dryer, car, whatever. And you think you're buying some and, 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 and you buy a warranty and you think you're buying some security that if something goes wrong, the warranty will take care of it. But I have found that not that's not always the case. A great warranty is good until you actually have to use it. And that's, that's when you find out that the warranty is good only on paper. The company backing it has no intentions of actually doing what it says, at least not without lots and lots of haggling. But we're Christ. We know that he came in the past. He, we, we have the Holy Spirit as our present confirmation. He, he came in the past, you know, in, in the New Testament, Christ came. But in our current day, we have the Holy Spirit as our confirmation. And we have the assurance that we can eagerly wait for his return. And Paul in verse 8 gives us the promise that he will keep us strong to the end. The King James Version of verse 8 says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? The Greek word for confirm is a word that I will not even begin to try and pronounce. But our English conversion of the word is will confirm. It speaks of the future. And when referring to, and when, when, when it's referring to a person, it means to strengthen and it means to keep us standing. It is the picture of the believers standing in Christ. He, he gave us his grace, which we have as our present, possession. And we're not going to lose his possession entrusted into us. We're not, we don't have to worry about losing it. Uh, we don't have to worry about misplacing it. He has given it to us and he's keeping it with us. No matter, it's like no matter the difficulties we may face now or in the future, they cannot move us. He is keeping us. He is keeping us standing straight and standing strong. I, I think most often, especially during difficult times in, in our lives, we, we will say stuff like, I'm just holding on to the hand, to God's unchanging hand. We tend to think that our security depends on me holding fast to God. And, and that is not where Paul found his comfort concerning the present or the future. The word will confirm is an active voice and the agent is Christ. Unlike the warranty that just looks good on paper, Christ is the agent who will confirm us, who will keep us firm, who will firm, confirm us. He holds us and, and will never let us go will never let us let go of us while we have faith. You know, once we have put our faith in Christ, then he holds us and he'll never let us go. A, a quote I read uh, from D.L. Moody says, trust in yourself and you are doomed to disappointment. Trust in your friends and they will die and leave you. Trust in your money, and you may have it taken from you. Trust in reputation, and some slanderous tongue may blast it. But trust in God, and you will never be confounded 
in time, in time or eternity. And, and, and in other words, he's saying trusting in God is a sure thing, not only for right now, but for in eternity. Our redemption is, is based in the past, but its completion is promised in the future. It's not a speculation. It's, it's a certainty. That Greek word for confirm comes from a word that means certain. Paul is saying that we are not just uh, to look at the past coming of Christ. You know, the Bible lets us know that Christ came in the past, but then the Bible also lets us know that he was in eternity, eternity past. But he is, it, it also it is to his future coming. His future coming is just as certain as his past coming. His coming in the future is as certain as his coming in the past. Christ will come back and reveal himself for the sake of the believers. Even though our lives may be messed up by our present environment and by the very fact that our bodies are decaying, <clears throat> you know, every day something's going wrong with them. But that will not be forever. It, it, it will not last forever. We will experience the personal intervention of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is ours now and in the future. He involves himself in the whole scheme of life. Sometimes it may seem like, where is God? But he is involved in, in the whole scheme of things. This world is not just evolving by nature. God is ex executing his own plan. And, and we can see it all around us. We may not understand it. We may not agree with it. But we can be of a certainty that God is executing his own plan. Think about how we as humans, uh, when we're getting ready to undertake uh, some major project, we make plans. We don't do it without first planning how we're going to do it and how we're going to uh, complete it. Now, that's just us. Do we think that God would have gone about making the world and, and making mankind without a complete plan? No. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, verse 11, the NIV says, For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now think about that. At the time of this prophecy, things were not going well for Jeremiah or the Israelites, at least not according to the physical eye, because, you know, part of them, they were in captivity. The, the people that were not in captivity at that time it, it, it was messed up in, in the homeland. So things were not um, going well, according to the physical eye. But according to God, everything was working according to plan. We can't figure out God, but we can trust him. Verse 8, he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. We will be blameless. We will be presented blameless. The teachings of the New Testament makes it plain that those who are true believers are called saints. So does that mean that we are perfect and sinless? Not so. You don't, you know, you don't really need me to answer that question. Even the greatest of saints are deeply conscious of their sin. The greatest, you know, saints, the great, the person who, who we think is, is right up there next to God almost, even they are conscious of their sin. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, when he was writing to Timothy, uh, who was his son in the faith, he, he said in 1 Timothy 1 and uh, 15, and this is the King James 
version. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And listen to this, of whom I am chief. This is Paul. And, and yet, this same Paul assures the believers in Corinth that they shall be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the question could, to be asked is, how can sinful creatures be considered blameless when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming? Again, we have to look at the Greek word that is translated blameless. And once again, I will not try to pronounce it. But the term denotes a person against whom there can be no charge or accusation. And it is speaking of the last judgment. We are told that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back again, he will confirm us believers as blameless. Now, this does not mean that the moment from the moment we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord to the day when we see him face to face at his second coming that we have never been guilty of any sin. No, we have been guilty of sin of commission, sins of omission and sin of intention. James 3 and 2 tells us that we all stumble in many ways. My, my, my feeble way of saying that is there's too many ways to be got to miss them all. And then 1 John 1 and 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Then in Matthew 16 verse 27, Jesus himself lets us know that the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he shall reward every man according to his works. That messes us up. So how can we say, how can we sinners be blameless? As believers in Christ, we are not sinless, but in Christ, we are blameless. No charge will be brought against us at Christ's coming. So we don't have to be afraid of his coming. We can eagerly await for his coming. We don't have to be afraid because he took our blame upon himself on Calvary's cross so that his righteousness might be imputed to all who came to the Father in repentance and faith through him. When we come to Jesus Christ, when we come to the Father through Jesus Christ in repentance, we are, we are imputed with righteousness. Our blame is taken away. Romans 8 and 1 tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The key to being presented blameless is in our position in Christ. Unfortunately, my position right now, as it relates to this lesson, is that I'm out of time. So come back next week to this same YouTube page, Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis Incorporated, INC, as we continue our study of a gospel church. And until then, be blessed and take care. Bye-bye.